right, welcome to the Dad the Best I Can podcast on BYLR Radio. Today we are lucky to be joined by Zach Bush. Zach owns one of the hottest bars and restaurants in Miami, Ball and Chain. He is the best-selling author of the children's books Made for Me and the Little Book of series and the Little Superhero series. Zach is a husband and most importantly, he is a dad. How's it going today, Zach? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited you're here. Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Miami, Florida. Miami, Florida. I see. Uh, what, what's behind you there? Grease oh, poster? A little Grease poster. Um, it is my wife's favorite movie. And if you've ever been to my house, you know, I, my, my house is adorned with lots of sports stuff. So she gets the bedroom and her favorite movie of all time, uh, Grease. So are there kids out there in school? Is that what's going on outside of the bedroom? There are kids. I am calling from the bedroom. There are kids that are in our virtual homeschool. Um, my son is getting ready to go back to school. Actually, their school started, but because my wife is pregnant, my son's going to go back to school after the baby's born. And my daughters, who's in preschool, they stopped virtual school and started real school, but we're holding her back until after the baby's born as well. A lot going on there. Just typical yes. 2020. Let's do it. Wow. I mean, the, between COVID, the pregnancy, um, my businesses, you know, being pretty much shut to a standstill currently, it's, it's been, there's a lot going on. So there's a lot for us to discuss today. All right. Well, before we get into all that business and dad life, I do have to tell a quick story that Zach and I, we grew up together since middle school, but we didn't really become as close of friends until a exciting trip to Vegas that we both took in 2006, where I think we wow. could both agree neither of us knew what the hell we were doing. But Correct. on that trip, Zach, we always played poker growing up in high school and everything instead of partying and having fun probably. But we, uh, we both qualified for the World Series of Poker on Party Poker, if anybody remembers back in the 2000s. Those were those were the days. And long story short, Zach and I both played in the World Series of Poker. And it was kind of a turning point in my life where I had some miraculous run of cards in the main event. And Zach was by my side. He was like coaching me up. He was giving me motivation. But I mean, do you remember that, that I, week well? I remember that week well. And it's amazing because you said it was 2006, right? Is that what you said? It just Correct. seems like lifetimes ago, like a lifetime ago, even though it was what, 15 years ago. But I mean, yes, I remember that trip. While you remember the poker glory, I remember um, the MBD, the mini bar diets, where I first introduced Rob, where, you know, you can try to survive on vacation by only <laughs> eating out of the mini bar. It is not healthy, but boy, is it exciting. Um, I, I, although Jesse Itzler would not approve of that because those are not healthy snacks. Um, but yeah, it was an incredible, it was an incredible trip. I would definitely say it was uh, life changing more so for you than for me, but still so excited to be there, you know, and I think I got knocked out day two um, and you kept going and building chip stacks. I remember, I'll let you tell the story. Do you remember us walking around at the different poker tables to see how these people even stack their chips? Cause you and I were playing online. We had no idea how to make chip stacks. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny. You see, I mean, this is a glimpse behind the curtain, like, there's a lot of pressure there. You don't really know what you're doing. And like you're saying, like if you, as you advance in these tournaments, you're getting a lot of chips, hopefully. And I was like, I don't even know how to like stack them. <laughs> like they do cool on ESPN and stuff. So we like walked around the Rio casino and we're like, Oh, I like what that guy's doing. So yeah. you can see I was a, a messy stacker, but it was pretty fun. And I'm glad, I'm glad you were a part of it. You were like my, my poker mentor in some ways. And it really uh, was a life changing event for me. Well, it didn't take long for, uh, if I was your mentor, it didn't take long for the student to um, be, be way more of a master than the teacher. Um, but yeah, it was really exciting. And I'm sure even for you looking back, I think in the moment we didn't realize how like special and unique it was like, yes, we knew it was special and you went on a crazy run, but like here we are now years later and neither of us really play poker. Um, and so obviously a lot has changed since then, but yeah, what an exciting, I still, I tell that story probably once a month to people. So it just, it's, 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 it's great that we were able to share that together. Yeah. I mean, that is, and that's a Jesse kind of thing is build life experiences, make memories. Uh, I'm sure like you, a lot of the things you're doing, we're completely winging it 
taking chances, falling on our faces. But, you know, that's, that's I think, overall the way to go. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So, Zach, tell us a little bit about your story. Post-college, you've had kind of a Forrest Gump-like existence doing all kinds of incredible things. Uh, tell us how, how you got started and where you're at today. Sure. I will try to, um, I could tell that story and it would take up several hours of your podcast. So I'll try to tell the short or the long short version of it is that <clears throat> basically uh, I was getting ready to graduate from Emory University. It was the year 2000. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I had a great opportunity to go into my family business, which is in the waste and recycling, uh, a business that really was started by my, my, my grandfather originally and then my father. Um, and you know, but by, by the same token, I challenged internally because it didn't really, you know, excite me. You know, it wasn't necessarily fo following your passion like we're so often told to do. So it was something that I really wrestled with my entire senior year. And then as it got close, um, I ended up making the, the decision, which was agonizing, to end up going to work with my family who both needed me. Now, keep in mind, I had worked in that family business on Christmas vacation, summer vacation since I was, you know, 15, 16 years old. So I very much knew the business and truthfully, um, the business needed me. Uh, luckily, I had a brother that was th that's three years older than, than I was. When I arrived, I had a desk and computer waiting for me. So I made that decision to go into the family business. Um, working with family is not always the easiest, but somehow um, I have an unbelievable relationship with my father and brother still to this day. So that was amazing. Um, but let's be honest, I was not satisfied socially. Um, so after, um, I think literally less than a year there, I, I wanted to do something else. So I taught myself how to DJ before I knew it literally within call it six months, I was DJing some of the, you know, hottest hip hop parties on South beach. I don't even know how it happened. Um, then after like a month of DJing, I realized that number one, at that time, DJs weren't, weren't getting all the girls and weren't necessarily making all the money. Like, you know, we, we've come to know from DJs. And all the pretty girls and all my friends were on the other side of the DJ booth. And here I am playing great music, but I wanted to be on the other side where the action was. So from that, I started, I left the DJ booth, started throwing my own parties with my best girlfriend. Um, and long story short, started throwing parties all over Miami Beach, but mostly at hotels. We carved out a niche in hotels. And from that, I learned a lot about marketing, nightlife, how to throw a good party, what it takes never knowing that, that that life would come full circle and that would be my full business. In 2000, around 11-ish, my brother and I had an opportunity to exit the waste and recycling business. Um, it, was not go, it was not to exit with yacht and a penthouse type money, you know, uh, go buy a yacht and a penthouse. It was someone offers you a dollar oh five for something worth a dollar. You think long and hard about it. We made the decision at that time to exit that business. We're both still very young. Uh, what are we going to do next? Uh, we thought we'd buy some real estate or a nice return. Not so easy, very competitive. Ended up the only other thing I knew about was that we could make money selling booze. Convinced my brother uh, very begrudgingly uh, at this opportunity to basically bring the historic ball and chain back to life. I was given that opportunity with my, with my lifelong best friend and, and brother from another mother, Bill Fuller, an entrepreneur in real estate down here in South Florida. Um, and so between myself, my brother and Bill, we were able to bring it back to life. Uh, we hit the ground running. Um, never had a honeymoon because I got married the week before. Then Ball and Chain opened, hit the ground running. Since then, I've opened up several other restaurants, a couple other bars, having our best year yet, and then COVID, and here we are. And in between, wrote a couple books. My, my son was born, got married. My daughter was born, wrote some books, uh, put myself out there, had no idea what I was doing, ended up the first book became an international bestseller. And here I am now talking to you, dad, the best I can. How right, was well, that? Let's, that's, that is quite a story. And I'd love yeah. to see these DJ. I saw a glimpse of the DJ days, but a young Zach on the South Beach DJ scene must have been a sight. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was definitely more wild. My wife would say I was way more fun, which is true. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, like all great experiences and, and, and great memories. And I think the one thing that, that, that it is, you know, when, when, when I speak, I speak a lot to students and to some younger people. I always say that um, it is important to follow your passion. Like even though I, didn't, I wasn't following my passion for necessarily my, my work, I was still keeping myself engaged. At that time, it was DJing and throwing parties, and life really did come full circle, where now 
as a restaurant uh, operator, owner, and business bar owner and operator, you know, it came full circle and I love what I do. So, whereas, you know, I didn't necessarily love what I did at the beginning in the waste and recycling, it was a tremendous means to an end. Um, and I also learned tremendous business sales experience in, 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 in that industry as well. So. So tell us real quick about, I mean, hopefully when somebody listens to this in a year or two, they're going to look back at 2020 as some complete aberration, but you're going through a, something I'm sure you could never have projected and your brother could never have anticipated with uh, the pandemic. I'm sure there are a lot of people that own bars and restaurants and small businesses that have been absolutely crushed. Um, what is that like going through that? What kind of things would you have done differently or tips you might even offer to other small businesses in that, in that industry? Sure. I mean, it's really been a whirlwind and um, I'm much more accepting of, of what's occurred now than I was, you know, in the moment when it's all happening and you kind of see like your life's work or my last, you know, six, seven years worth of work and building these businesses come to a screeching halt. You know, it, it's very alarming. It still is, but you just get more used to, you know, what's going on right now. Um, I would say that, that, you know, everyone talks about, oh, having to be able to pivot and, oh, you know, what can you do in your industry to pivot? And it's much, I believe it's much easier said than done. It's one thing to be creative and think of ways you can make money. But when you're a restaurant operator, um, you make your living with, with people in your restaurants and bars, you know, um, having restaurants and bars open at 25% capacity, 50% capacity, you're not making money there. Most of these restaurants are built to be at 90 to 100%, some of them even at 150% capacity. So it's been very challenging. I would say the biggest thing that we learned as an organization is that all of our operations, bars, restaurants, even our bars serve food. Food is a predominant uh, uh, factor. Of course, we sell booze where there's better margins and we love selling the booze, but we're also a restaurant. However, um, at least in Dade County where we are in South Florida, you could be licensed as a restaurant or a bar. Uh, little did I know that you could be licensed as both. So I know this sounds a little bit weird and might be confusing for those not in the industry, but basically it's much easier to be licensed as a restaurant than a bar. In a restaurant down here, and I think it's, it's pretty standard, to be a restaurant you have to sell at least 51% food compared to, you know, the, compared to alcohol sales. To be a bar, you can sell as, many, as much booze as you want and don't need to sell food. However, in the days of COVID and the pandemic, Restaurants are allowed to open, but not necessarily bars. Certainly, that's the that, that's that's the um, the space that we're in down here in South Florida and Dade County. Restaurants have been allowed to open since pretty much early on, and so now we've literally spent months trying to add to our certificate of use, while we still are a bar that we're also legally a restaurant. So that's one of the things that we're doing now so that, number one, we don't get hit with this again. And if, God forbid, there is another pandemic in the future, at least we can open as a restaurant and not uh, take a bath totally. Um, you know, my, my, my ball and chain is my mothership operation. We've been pretty much shuttered for six months. And, you know, we've had to furlough a, a lot of great people. And, um, you know, I have no doubt we'll be back stronger than ever. And I think we're getting closer every day. But that would be some of my words of wisdom. It's crazy that you could could never have anticipated. I'm sure you go through every different uh, risk management when you're setting up this business. Did did your brother, who I know is, I don't want to say the brains behind the operation, but he's definitely more of the, you know, nuts and bolts business side. Could yes. he have ever even imagined that like something would just shut down your business and you wouldn't be able to open it? There's just no way. I mean, we, we look at our projections uh, before the year um, and we map out a best case middle of the road in a worst case scenario. Um, and, you know, there's, we're, here we are having our, you know, cruising along. Now, granted, it was only like February, March, having our best year yet. You know, you count on maybe a down year being off like 20%, 30%. I don't think anyone is in business and ever uh, imagines a 98, 99% drop off in business because it's hard to explain a circumstance where that would actually occur. But yet here we are. And, you know, there, there's, you know, you just got to, one of our new sayings is, you know, you just got to keep marching forward, put one foot in front of the other, come up with a, a plan that makes sense on how you're going to get through these times as best as possible. And I know, you know, I think that we're fortunate and uh, we're way more fortunate than others because we do control 
Um, we are also our landlords at all of our, or in some capacity, all of our venues, um, which makes it much easier in regards to paying rent and knowing that you're going to be there forever. Um, but you know, the, the hospitality world in general is not for the faint of heart and COVID and the pandemic is just another, another testament to that. So I think, uh, it kind of leads into, we both have this mutual admiration for Jesse Itzler. I don't know how you were introduced to him. I think it was a uh, early Goggins, Goggins book. And I mean, he really is a living testament too. you just got to build up resiliency. You've just got to keep moving forward, keep taking action. What has been your uh, connection with Jesse and how do you embrace those things in business? And then like getting into being as a dad, what kind of things do you take? Sure. From I've you? never met Jesse personally, although one of these days I, I keep hoping that I'll get the random, hey, you want to you know, come to my house and get in the, uh, the ice tub? Or uh, whatever. <laughs> but um, but uh, Jesse's been an inspiration of mine and a role model of mine for many, many years. I think it was when I first read Living with a Seal, which to this day I think is one of the greatest books ever. Actually, relatively, sometime in the last year, I just listened to it for the first time on audio and it was even better. Um, Jesse's the man. I mean, and, and kudos to you for having your podcast now on BYLR radio. I mean, anything having anything anyone can do to like emulate Jesse, you're heading in the right direction. I mean, um, you've been kind enough to compliment me in the past and say that like, I'm your own homegrown version, mini version of Jesse. And that's the greatest compliment that anyone really could ever, ever give me or ever give anyone. Um, you know, Jesse, Jesse is one for setting goals, which you know how, how critical it is, and for basically no excuses, no days off, um, and for going out there and kind of, uh, in my own words, what I would say is going out there and creating your own magic. Um, and both he's done that, obviously his wife has done that. And I mean, if you don't follow Jesse on, on Instagram, I would imagine most of your um, listeners do. But if you don't, you should, because he is really... Um, if I had to put down, you know, some of my greatest life inspirations, you know, Jesse Itzler's in the top three and I've never even met the guy. Well, I think for, for me, there are a lot of inspiring people out there, but I found it, I don't know about you, once you have kids, your life changes so dramatically that it can be hard to relate to people that are not, you know, waking up at 6am with their kids in their bed, doing these kind of things. And Jesse really has got four kids under 10. To me, that's like one of the most relatable things and sh seeing how he is really modeling this behavior, which is something I'm sure you're doing for your kids, whether it's intentional or not, how would you think, how do you think that kind of brings that element into your life as a dad and, and what you want to pass on to your kids? Wow, that, that, that's a great question. I mean, I, I do think that it's very easy. Look, whether you're a dad, whether you're working nine to five, whatever it is, it's always easy to make excuses, you know, like it's much easier to be on the couch and turn on Netflix than it is to, you know, go out and, and, and run a mile or walk a mile or, or, or open a book and read a book. It's just what you what your comfortability is. So I think it's important to, you know, that's one of the reasons that I think Jesse always stresses mapping out your life in, in the in the big ASS calendar club. And, um, you know, how do I relate to that? I think that um, I've always been what I consider a pretty good manage, uh, pretty good at time management, but it just becomes so much more critical as you have other responsibilities. So first you become a husband, or in my case became a husband, you've, you know, new responsibilities there, but more, more or less, you know, your life doesn't change all that much. Then you have kids and your world's flipped upside down. Now you're beholden to your, 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 your wife or, or you know, your, your significant other and your ch child and then your children and everything really does, you know, stop and start with your kids. So I, I think that it's, 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 it's critical to, you know, map everything out, get that time in with them and, you know, make it a priority. Like, like your, your life is, is yours to do whatever you want with. It's what are you going to choose to, to make a priority today, tomorrow, forever. And in 2020, as much of a, just circus disaster it's been it really has kind of brought these things to light that you have don't have control over it it is on you to create these things and that's going to mean failure and taking chances and I think that's one thing that you know I really do like and admire about Jesse but I also find it can be daunting for other 40 something year old dads that aren't Jesse or aren't you starting their own business but I still want to help kind of bring that mindset to other people that just because you're 40 and you have two, three kids and your life is a circus, we're going through that too. And there are, 
elements that you can take that you just don't have to check out and you know next well, thing you know you're 70 I, right i think you and i even talked about this a little bit in the past is that look you watch jesse the guy you know runs marathons runs you know battle of the hill 100 miles this. you don't need to start with that just commit to you know walking or jogging a mile you know every day or five days a week like it's okay to start small because that's something small might seem small but it's a very big deal um because it takes commitment and anyone can say all right I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get a Peloton and I'm going to, you know, work out, you know, three days a week, four days a week. And sure, the, the first couple of weeks are easy, but where are you going to be six months from now, a year from now? And those little baby steps lead to good habits. And also it's rewarding personally when you can set yourself a plan and a goal and stick to it. So I think that, uh, you know, to, to, to go along with what you were saying, that, that you start off small. You're not going to run a marathon tomorrow. Right. And I, I think a lot about too. I mean, we've all, I mean, I got married a little later now, ex married. That's a whole other story for another podcast. But I mean, I really do think about this isn't just about me anymore. This is obviously your kids are the priority, but it's, I can't just be telling them, go do this, go, you know, even we go to McDonald's and it's like, I want him to go up and ask for the switch the toy, you know, if he wants right. to do it, because I think that is building some kind of muscle that's going to be important in his life so we can't just tell them what to do you need to be out there doing it and that's the only way kids i think are learning and i think in 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 parallel with that i, I i've gotten myself into the habit in in the past i would say probably for two years now that I, as weird as this might sound is before i go to sleep after i wash my face brush my teeth i look in the mirror and i kind of ask myself are you proud of yourself today and would your kids be proud of you today? And I think that by asking myself those two questions, uh, sometimes I fail. And when I fail, especially when it comes to would your kids be proud of you today, um, whether I lost my cool or you know I wasn't kind to um, in the heat of the moment with you know you know one of my business partners or you know uh, maybe maybe I texted some words that I can't take back. Um, cause I'm very passionate and I'm a very big believer in, you know, I wear my emotions on my sleeve, which is both a, a positive attribute, but can also be a detriment at time. And it's one of the things that, that I've learned over time is, you know, to, to really look, look deep into your, your soul and make sure that, that you're proud and that your children would be proud if they were, you know, your shadow for an, for the entire day. That goes, that's very much, I just heard Jesse saying, he always looks back at the end of the day and he said, would I hire myself as a, you know, to run this business? Would I hire myself as a dad? And unfortunately, a lot of those days are going to be no. And I think right. that's, uh, you know, just being aware of it, also being gentle and cool with yourself because, you know, that's the thing about parenting. There's so much failure. It's so thankless at times that it can get in your head. But I think I like that idea of kind of that nightly check-in. I know for me, I can go a whole day and doing 78 different things with the kids and with business and podcasts. And it's like the end of the day, sometimes I feel like I don't even know what I've done today. Right. So right. writing it down, I think is important. And it could be even, I want to do three important things. And if you get those things done, you can go to sleep feeling like, uh, you know, you made an impact. Yeah. And it's okay to fail. Like I, I think I had a post on Instagram either last week or the week before where I had one of my worst days. I think that I remember where I had, argued with, with uh, my brother and one of my other business partners. I, ha I didn't make proper time for my wife. The kids were asleep before I got to stop and smell the roses. And I really felt like, what a waste of a day. Um, and that's gonna happen sometimes. Thankfully for me, you know, that really horrible day, I don't, I don't remember having one like that in a long, long time and don't plan on having one again. But it's, it's all about how you rebound and how do you make the next day better and how do you learn from it and how do you, again, not to sound cliche, put one foot in front of the other and keep marching forward. Absolutely. So you have two kids. How old are they now? My son Ace is five. My daughter Ava is four. And as you know, we have one on the way, the, a miracle baby. Doctors told us. So uh, this is an interesting story, segue a little bit, is that I have a baby on the way, C-section scheduled October 5th. Very excited, a baby girl. But long story short is my wife really wanted a third. Um, I was happy to oblige, uh, but I had some medical issues after my second was born. Long story short, we were trying, trying, no luck. My doctor kept telling me, look, it's going to be hard unless you, uh, you know, see a specialist and you and your wife and make that decision. I dragged my wife to the specialist. 
Specialist basically tells my wife what I've been waiting for someone to tell my wife so she could hear it from a doctor and not from me. You have less than a 1% chance of getting pregnant naturally. And a week later, we were pregnant naturally. And <laughs> here we are with this miracle. Uh, and that's because of my issues, not hers. Um, and you know, here we are with this miracle baby now that we've gone through COVID together and, and we couldn't be more excited and, and nervous, excited, and more than anything, just I'm, 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 I'm excited. Yeah, that's, this is an interesting little, I mean, this is one of the things I like about this podcast is that in 10 years from now, you'll be able to listen to this or see this video and say, this is what I looked like before my now, you know, eight-year-old third kid is born and look how calm Zach is and I can't wait to see you. You're not going to lose any more hair but like it's well, uh it's I still it's, like to say I'm BBC. I'm bald by choice. I still <laughs> throw a full head of hair but you know but it's what, all right. What is it like a uh, pregnant wife? How is she handling this? Is there a lot of anxiety with the you know? My wife is a champ. Uh, truly a champ. Um, I you know a lot of my friends say they don't know how I got her um, uh, but she, she's She's amazing. This has been her hardest pregnancy, um, physically, and I'm sure COVID and being home with the kids, you know, you know, and when you have two toddlers, you know, they need entertainment. It's not like you could just say, you know, and we're not a very like iPod friendly house, you know, we don't really, you know, give a lot of screen time. Um, so, I mean, she's been through the ringer. It's been very tough for her. Um, I have been there to support her. I think she, she might argue that uh, she, I, didn't, I don't support her enough, but um, she knows we're there for it. It's been very tough on her physically, um, but, but she's a trooper, man. Um, and and we're, we couldn't be more excited. So the siblings, do they, do they know what's coming? It's gonna be, it's an interesting thing. You come from, you, it's just you and your brother, so that's Correct. two. Does she come from a bigger family? My wife comes from three, uh, and she always wanted at least three. Um, um, and you know, I, I think people tend to, to, to want what they come from uh, more often than not. Um, I was always open to the idea of having more than two. Thankfully, we are having a third. And you know, there's stuff to think about, the middle child syndrome. You know, a lot of times people think about, well, can we afford it? Can we do, at the end of the day, we're gonna have this, 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 this third child. Uh, the third child's gonna be loved beyond measure. I know one of the things, that I, because I, I have a feeling this is our last uh, child, uh, is that I really am going to focus, even though I tried to focus before, on, you know, the, you have the first kid and it's like everything's brand new. You don't know what you're doing. Then the second kid, you kind of think you're a pro. Um, you know, you don't really, you still don't really know. But by the third, you kind of know what's going on. You kind of know what to expect. And like, as you know, they are so little for such a snippet in time. It's like a frozen moment. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm really looking forward to hanging on to those moments uh, and cherishing them. Uh, that, that's really all I can say. It, 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 I, I get like a, a nod in my heart a little bit because I'm, I'm just vastly excited. I'm, I'm incredibly excited for it. It, it's, it is so different, like you're saying, because you don't, a lot of that you maybe. Three, right? Don't you, you have three. I, I do have three. And a lot of that anxiety that you have with the kids, like, oh, they're going to crawl over here, or this is going to happen. Are they breathing in their bed? It's like right. that kind of goes away. So you can be a little more present. Granted, you're being pulled in so many different directions, it becomes challenging. And I'll be talking to myself several times a day, like, I don't know how people do this. Right. I feel like I'm a camp director half the time. But right. You know, and it is, you're going to encounter new issues because there is a third kid and there's going to be some, whether it's middle child syndrome, you have boy, girl, girl. So she could be, you know, jealous of the baby. But I think, I mean, what's cool about this podcast is I've learned a lot too. I've talked to dads that have five kids and they're like, oh, I went through this. And <laughs> I think we've heard, I know Jesse said it as his dad tip, but really carving out that one-on-one -on -one time, which we, we talked yesterday to prep for this interview and we were going through you know, it's challenging. I'm recently divorced. So the kids are at multiple houses. There's this whole virtual school circus going on. And even you saying it, like, I think I need that reminder all the time too, just because you know something, it doesn't mean you're living it. And I told my, my ex, uh, I said, I want you to take our middle child. And she took him on a hike or something. She was really cool. It was great. And I got to spend time with my oldest and it's, it is like a completely different experience. I don't know if you feel this way now, even just with two, like when you and Ace can have a one-on-one -on -one time, no mom there, no sister there, 
it's like you can you can laugh about stuff that you never would they can confide in you about stuff and that's that's one thing that even i mean i wrote it down like this week i want it once a week with each kid even if it's one hour go for a walk because they love it more than anything it really is like uh you know it's a new experience for them all of a sudden their attention is being divided so that's something that you know i need the reminder of all the time and uh you'll definitely find as you grow to a bigger family that's really important too yeah i i can't, i mean you kind of stole my dad's tip a little bit there is that i i think that the one-on-one -on -one time is is so critical and it's even something that i've experienced a little bit during covid and to backtrack for a second is that I'm not as worried about middle child syndrome because my second has a really strong personality. And again, and again, anything can happen. Um, but as you know, I think being aware of it also, um, and again, you never know till you're in the moment, but back to the one-on-one -on -one time is that, you know, I, I have an autoimmune uh, deficiency. So I've been super careful during the whole COVID thing. So one of the things, one of the benefits that I would say of being, you know, stuck at home and, and home with the kids is that, um, you know, way more frequently than I was before is the one-on-one -on -one time. We focus, now a lot of it is, is I've kind of carved out, you know, 45 minutes to an hour a day um, with each kid. And we've been doing that now, God, for probably like three or four months. Now, now it's focused a lot on educational stuff. Um, where, you know, I've taught my kids the state capitals, you know, individually trying to help them, you know, learn to read and write. But even that one on one time, while it's educational now um, in nature, I don't see it always staying that way. You know, um, of course, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of education and, you know, learning and, and doing whatever we can to foster that with, you know, with our children. But I believe that that like Jesse said, and like you said, that it is so critical because like, more than I enjoy it, and, and I really do enjoy it, I know how much my kids enjoy it. You know, they they look forward to, oh, I get to spend time with daddy now. Oh, I get to, you know, do this with daddy now. And like, there's nothing like that. And, and not to say that we don't have incredible times as a family or me and both kids or my wife and I and, and both kids soon to be three. Um, as much as I enjoy it, I know the kids enjoy it. And really at the end of the day, what's it all about? It's about seeing those little smiles and um, the, hearing their laughs and um you know doing the thankless jobs as parents that that we do and kudos to you because i think nobody has it harder than single moms or dads divorced moms and dads i think you and i spoke you know earlier in the week and i said that if i had three kids and i knew i had them for you know three days my first goal would be survival you know and then my second goal would be all right how can i try to make this time special for you know each one of them individually and i don't even know if it's possible true when you said camp director like i think you kind of nailed it yeah i mean i'm learning as i go and i think it is you need to just find these moments because you know even parenting is generally thankless frustrating i mean <laughs> i'm not afraid to say it i do like i i even get resentful sometimes i'll see on instagram these families just all the time i'm like that is not real life <laughs> not that you need to represent that i mean i i personally find it more enjoyable but I think you just have to recognize that like that is what a lot of your day might look and feel like. But, you know, and that's another thing I learned. Uh, I guess he actually runs BYLR Radio, Mike Johnson. He was quoting, he's got two young kids, a little younger than yours. And he was quoting Aristotle who said, show me a child until the age of seven and I'll show you the man. And what that means that he took that from a... You know, I think a scientist, an author who said that there's so much wiring going on in a kid's brain up until age seven, that it's going to dictate so much of their life, their relationships. I mean, you even see how you deal with, you know, your wife is a lot, how your parents deal with each other. So I really try to like, almost like hold on to the rails sometimes and say, I got to get to, not to say I got to get to seven and I'm out, but these, some of these moments are very important in how we're molding these kids. So it's, and the hardest That's thing, a good to reminder, do, the hardest thing to do, which I think doesn't get discussed enough is to take the qualities that we don't love about ourselves and remove them from your kids. Um, that what's is one an example of, of that for you. Um, what's an example of that for me? Number one, I think I need to be a better listener and at times and, um, and number two, and what, what, what is probably the, the biggest thing is sometimes my wife and even my, co my, my, my business partners say that it's not what I say, it's how I say it. And I think sometimes my tone is not reflective of, 
of, or maybe my tone is too reflective of how I'm feeling and that, you know, you need to, uh, Make sure that you're cognizant of always speaking kindly. My, we have a saying in our house that my wife adopted, you know, kind words, kind heart. Um, and I think it's really helped, helped me. But when I see like my son start to get frustrated with, with his sister, my daughter, um, and start to, you know, raise his voice, um, it drives me mental. And why does it drive me mental? Because I don't want to raise my voice. I know at times I do. And that's one of the things when you check yourselves at night in the mirror and you say, well, are you proud of yourself today? Would you? kids be proud of yourself today but I think in general one of the hardest things to do is to take the stuff that we don't love about ourselves and try to kind of remove those traits from our kids yeah I always say uh self-awareness is a mother effer because it's yeah. like it's like you know what you're doing isn't right and now you but I do think it's important to like have that kind of glitch in your head I see what I'm doing and I'll even you know yell at my kids because it's frustrating especially towards bedtime and I'll say, like, once I get them in bed, look, I'm sorry how I acted like that. And I, I know it's, it might just sound like words, but I want to kind of implant that in their mind that I can screw up too and that you can recover from that. It's not their fault. Uh, we're human too. So all these little I, reminders too, I need, I need daily. So I think Jesse had a post on it a couple of weeks ago and he reminded me, like, one of the things that I think we all long for is our to know that our parents or people that we look up to are proud of us. So since he reminded us or his followers, I've been very cognizant of letting my kids know, you know, I'm proud of you. Yeah. You know, you know, you're just a great kid. I'm proud of, you know, and I, I think that, that, you know, the, I love you's the, I'm proud of you's, you know, are just so important. Yeah. And they can't, I mean, we had baseball practice yesterday and you know, my kid, he had, he, we're still learning how to catch a ball. That's an advanced skill that I'm learning. And okay. he, he does not want to play first base. He got like upset about it and kind of, I was trying to be, you know, there's always that balance too. If you want to be firm, you got to try stuff, but you want to be gentle too. Like, I don't want to push my kid into things. He gets hit right. in the head by a baseball is naturally not going to want to go play first base. But um, yeah, it's like learning that balance and yeah, I think it is just like you always have to learn it, but you do. Those words are important. You know, we they do sometimes feel like cliche too, right? I love you so right. much. I, uh, but like, I think it is, like you said, the words that you use, these kids are absorbing everything. Absolutely. Um, let's talk to, we talked a lot about, you know, the challenges of being a dad. There's obviously the kids, but the idea of self-care and friendship. I know we're really lucky to be involved in a, a group chat, group WhatsApp chat, what's up to the lucky bunch. Shout out to the lucky bunch. Something that helps me get through the day. How important is that to you, like having friendships and taking time for yourself? Um, I'm a, so beyond, I'm one of those people that needs time for myself. Um, I need time to gather my thoughts. You know, um, I'm a big proponent of TM, meditation. Um, Without it, I'm lost. I like, like I, I, as much as I need a shower in the morning, like I need my TM. I've come to kind of do both simultaneously. Um, but uh, the, the the time for myself and the time to it used to be like watching a ball game or a sports game or football or basketball. Now, of course, you know NFL just started. Awesome. We got our Miami Heat. You know, still alive, rocking in the Eastern Conference Finals. Hopefully they'll close that out. But now more than anything, it's like take a moment to pause, to breathe, to regain balance. You know, we're on, like, like, like you mentioned, we're on a WhatsApp thread with, what, 12 of our, 12 or so of our, our lifelong friends going back, you know, 20 plus, 30 plus years. Um, sometimes it gets a little political. Sometimes it gets a little, you know, whatever. But more often than not, it's about friendship, camaraderie, making each other laugh. Um, and I think we've all, as we get older, treasure those, those, those moments, um, especially during COVID where we can't, you know, grab lunch, go grab a beer, go grab dinner. Um, I, and, and, and with a lot of these, uh, you know, we're, we're spread out, which I think you're the lone soldier in Georgia, but the rest of us are either in South Florida or New York, I think for the most part. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a way to stay connected without being physically connected. And I think that, you know, it's important because you can get lost in being a dad, being a father, being a husband, you know, with your job. And that at the end of the day, it's about these, what, real connections with real people. Um, and, and we're lucky to have that and each other. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I write about this in uh, Dad, the Best I Can book, which you are featured in. Thank a, you. Uh, Amazing a, book. If you haven't, if you haven't read it or gotten it, please go online, get that book because 
Um, I've read it, I think, twice now, and every single time I pick up a new dad dad tip from one of the amazing dads that that you you interviewed. Yeah, I think, and one of the things I take from it, and I think about this a lot, is, and I'm sure every generation of parents say say this, but it seems like dads are doing more than ever between your work, between your spouse, between your kids. Now, time for yourself if you can find it. Your friends. It's like this is a whole new world we're living in. And I don't think we've certainly haven't been giving the training manual. So I think like making sure we prioritize that time for yourself because it does, you know, your wife might not want to hear it, but you're always going to come back in a better mood if you're going to get some time, whether it's meditating, whether it's I got to go have lunch with a buddy, whether it's I got to go for a walk myself. And I think like we need to be almost taught that that's okay, that we are taking on a lot, you know, much respect to moms out there who've been doing a lot of this forever. And I think we're just getting a glimpse of it, but yes. I think, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit laughing because my wife knows me so well, especially now she'll say, uh, did you meditate today? And she knows like if I didn't get a full, well, you need to go meditate and, and, you know, come back. Uh, and I always do, I come back, you know, refreshed and, and, and a new man. And one of the other thing that's interesting is that you would think like sleeping in late, you would, you know, if you got to sleep in a little bit, you would be less tired. But I find myself if I wake up earlier and meditate, I have more energy and I'm more focused and I'm more productive than if I were to sleep an extra hour. So it's one of the things I constantly remind myself is that not how you feel right when you open your eyes, but how am I going to feel 30, 40 minutes later after I get this meditation? In? And, and for me, it's become critical. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, and I call it my daddy's go, needs to go in the closet time because I got to find my own spots. And now I'll have a three year old walking in, turning on the lights, say, Time, all done with meditating, daddy. And it's just <laughs> like the cutest and most annoying thing simultaneously. But I never used to do that. I used to kind of roll my eyes even about it. And whether you right. call it meditation, whether it's I need to go take a walk for eight minutes by myself, you need to do those things because you're taking on more than you ever have before. And if you burn out, you're, you're no use to anybody. Correct. I mean, you, you nailed it right there. So I'd like to ask a lot of the guests on the podcast, what's, now that you're a parent and about to be a parent to three, what is one thing that you now can look back at that you learned from your dad or your parents that you're applying as a parent today? Wow. Um, I, I'm very fortunate to have two amazing parents. Uh, High school sweethearts, still married, celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it would be hard for me to pick just a couple of things. You know, my dad is really my role model. Um, you know, my biggest hero certainly has his faults like we all do, but have learned so much from him. I would say integrity, honesty, loyalty. Those are probably three words that, that define him and that um, I want I have tried to emulate um, as as a young, you know, first a young man, then you know, a little older man, now a father and husband, and certainly I want to teach my my children about um, integrity, acting with integrity. It's not what you're doing when the cameras are on; it's what are you doing when no one's looking. Um, and you know, honesty, you know, being truthful to others, truthful to yourself, and loyalty. Um, you know, it's just it's. Th th those are, I think, probably three of, of my favorite characteristics of my father, stuff he instilled in both my brother and I. And literally, um, you know, it's funny because, because it's funny. Um, shout out to him. <laughs> it's funny because um, you don't realize, like, like when, 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 when you're going to be a father, you're like, oh, I want to raise my kid to be this, 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 and this. And then you actually, like, have kids and you have to kind of mold them into be good people, quality individuals with these characteristics that that are going to make you proud and it is it's really it's really a tall order keep it oh, real, keep it real it. Zach. well here you got to meet ace ace what what happened ava's being mean okay daddy's doing an interview right now but when i'm done can i come down and talk to you and ava can you say hi to robbie hi ace there's ace all right daddy's gonna go finish and then we'll talk about ava being mean okay i love it Keep it real, Zach. And look hey, what are you going to do? Sorry about that. I can't wait to hear that conversation, too, uh, of how you handle sister being mean. Well, generally, what I, I, what, I, what I think is going to happen there is that she is being mean because um, he wanted, like, like she, he was doing something. She wanted to do it with him. And 
it didn't end well for him. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, my, yeah. my, I got to make sure that he really left. Hold on. Okay, he's gone. I can speak freely. Pretty. He can speak. I can speak freely. <laughs> Sorry. Is that generally, um, you know, my, my, my daughter is very kind, has a very kind heart. We're work, my, my son is kind and amazing also, but we're working on him uh, being a little bit nicer to his sister. So I would have to go, I'm going to go into that argument. I'm going to go into that, you know, disagreement downstairs. And I'm probably going to side with his sister who he said was being mean, but I doubt was really being mean. Yeah, I never know how to handle those things too, because in a lot of ways, I do want them to figure it out themselves. And I feel like they do, but it's like my instinct to put out the fire or just like stop annoying me with you're both whining about each other. So I'm like, I always try and check myself and I'm like, all right, let's see, you guys figure it out. You do all right? All yeah. right. <laughs> Conflict resolution, it's an important skill. Let me see you guys work it out. Very important. Real quick, touch on, uh, you said your parents 50 years married. You told me an amazing story. You had a, a Zoom, I guess, uh, anniversary party. What was the, I mean, it was one of the coolest gifts and coolest ideas I've heard. What did you do for your parents? Sure, well, we had got together, uh, you know, we, we, my parents are, you know, have been very careful of like, you know, if, if, if they make sure that my brother and our family, we haven't really been around other people, you know, they're, they're very nervous as they should be and, and we try to take all precautions. So our family got together, our immediate family got together for their 50th anniversary at my brother's house. And then we told them that we had a Zoom call with other family relatives. And then in the middle of the Zoom call, I was able to get one of our favorite comics, the incredibly talented Jesse Kirsten, to kind of crash the Zoom call and roast my parents. Her and I, you know, I had never met her. Uh, been a fan of hers. I know my parents are huge fans of hers. Seen her at Comedy Cellar. You and I are are loves of stand up comedy. So you know these names are are kind of second nature to us. But to any of your listeners who might not be, Jesse Kirsten is uh or was pre COVID a fairly regular at 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 a uh, Comedy Cellar. Hysterical. Um, and I and my parents love her as well. They had seen her down here, you know, pre COVID. And I was able to kind of get her to crash the Zoom and really kind of roast my parents. So, um, you know, Jesse, Jesse has her own podcast and she's phenomenal. Um, and she's just, she's just great. And my parents were thrilled. Uh, in retrospect, I wish I would have recorded it, but everything kind of happened so fast. I, I dropped the ball on, on that. Um, but it was, it was just great. Of course, she doesn't know my parents. Uh, we, we, we spoke and emailed and I sent her over some stuff. And of course she was able to, you know, weave it into natural conversation with them. And it was, you know, it was, it was, it was an awesome gift that came out even better than I imagined it would. It just, it just all worked out. What was, what was their reaction? Can your mom take a joke and uh, your dad oh, enjoy yeah. it? Yeah. I remember my, I remember they were sitting on zoom and my dad goes, Whoa, it's, it's Jesse Carson. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, it kind of started from there. And they, but, you know, both my parents are, look, you can't be a fan of stand-up comedy and not know how to take a joke yourself. I feel yeah. like the two, you know, the, the, those two ideals are not congruent. Yeah. So they could handle it. And, and, you know, there was roast and also a lot of love there. Um, but it was awesome. And, and if, if any of your listeners are not, um, are not fans or have not heard of Jesse, I suggest following her on social media, checking out her podcast too, because she's great. That's a great idea too. In a world that's changing all the time, like being able to come up with like a creative gift like that. I mean, that's, and you can reach out to these people on Instagram. It's uh, it's really, it's a, it's a neat idea that I might have to try. I don't know if my mom could take it as well, but something hey, like that. Maybe you could gift it to the lucky bunch. Oh, there you go. We do love the cameo. The cameo yes. is, a, is, a, is another really fun one. I saw Itzler's on cameo now, too. I mean, it's, is he? yeah, it's great. Oh, amazing. All right, Zach, you know what time it is? Rapid fire. <laughs> My favorite part of your podcast. Let's go. I'm excited for this. All right, Zach Bush. What is the first car you ever owned? Toyota Celica. And I love that thing. What is your first I'm job? I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I know it's rapid fire. Toyota Celica nicknamed the Miami Sound Machine. Oh, wow. wow. 305, represent. represent. What was your first job? My first job was at Red Berries. Oh, no, my first job was a baseball umpire, Little League umpire. What is your favorite meal to eat for dinner? Ooh, it's a toss-up between steak and pizza, but I'd probably go pizza. How about, your, how about your kid's favorite meal? My kids love Anthony's Pizza. Uh, it's and Anthony's is very good. Don't get me wrong. I happen to think there's better pizza. Anthony's is excellent. My kids love Anthony's. What is your favorite dramatic movie of all time? 
who would we consider Shawshank Redemption? I loved. I love. I love it. Every time it's on, I can't turn it off. But I think the number one choice on this podcast is Shawshank. How about favorite comedy movie? This is a tough one. I've changed my answer even four times just asking it. I'm going to go with it's so tough. Let's go with the old movie Stripes. Oh, a classic. How right. about favorite? I know you mentioned Jesse. Who's your favorite stand up comedian right now? Jesse Kirsten, right now, of all, I mean, look, Jesse, I mean, look, I love Chris Rock, um, all the huge names. My favorite ever was probably Mitch Hedberg. Um, you know, I think he, 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 I think he OD'd at a very, very early age, kind of right after I had heard of him. I, I had seen a special of his. He was coming to, you know, Miami. And before he got here, he passed away. But, but I still quote his stuff probably once a week. Yeah, I love give us him. one Mitch, Mitch joke. I know you've got a couple in your back pocket. Sure. I went to the store to buy a candle holder. They did not have a candle holder. So I bought a cake. <laughs> How'd I do? That's a great delivery, too. He's just got these random one-liners that I'm yeah, that's like. that's it. They're all just, like, very, like, obscure. Like, you know, I just, like, you know. Yeah. I Favorite. I know you're a music fan. Wait, one music. more Mitch. One more Mitch. Yeah, go. I like vending machines because snacks are better when they fall. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm done. I'm done. Favorite live concert you've ever seen? Billy Joel, Madison Square Garden. I was, like, a teenage girl. I went with my wife right before we got engaged. Um, and I think we were like second or third row and they opened up the first two rows to let us, you know, rush the stage. And like, literally here I am belting out every word. My wife was looking at me like she knew I liked Billy Joel, but I don't think she knew that I like loved Billy Joel. Um, and that was just incredible. All right. If you were a major league baseball player, what would be your walkout song? I've gone back and forth with this before. Um, I'd have to probably go with Lose Yourself just because, you know, it's just, it's just by Eminem. It just gets me pumped up. And, like, I could just see myself hitting dinger after dinger after hearing that song. I have to say, we have to bring up in, uh, like, a 20-second story. Can you tell us? I was going to say, what's your proudest athletic achievement, which you might have a different answer to. But you were an international baseball Little League star. Is that correct? Uh, sure. <laughs> I guess a little bit, maybe. Tell us your moment. Tell us your moment that's captured. You were there. On, like, Weren't you in Mexico? I was in Mexico. You had a moment captured on VHS it captured, tape. It was captured by accident where basically I was the youngest on the team. It was a traveling team playing a tournament in Mexico. Uh, we were down by three. I was up with the bases loaded. I was not one of the best hitters on the team. In fact, I was one of the worst. Coach called me over. I was a really good bunter. Asked me if I wanted to bunt. I think he was scared I was going to hit and do a double play. There was one out. Um, I said, no, I don't want to bunt. They brought in a new pitcher. Opposite field, right field yard, gone. Gone. And it's all on video. Now, granted, it is not the best quality by today's, by today's standards. But I have already shown my kids. I've already shown my wife. And that, I would have to say, is probably my greatest athletic achievement. If I can go back, it's like my Al Bundy, but before high school years, you know, Little League. Do you remember that, that feeling, like, of doing it, or is that just a blur? I, it's a total blur. Uh, but when I watch the tape, I remember, like, like, I don't know if it's just seeing, you know, when I, when I watch the video of it, um, I, emotion comes back. Because, like, you know, how cool is that, that it happened? But, like, now being a dad, like, if like one of my kids were to do that, like I can't imagine feeling yeah. like more like, pr- like it's such a silly thing, but like I grew up, you know, obviously I was, I was very into athletics. Um, but it's just, you know, like I, I look forward to moments like that where my children make me proud, not sports related, but just anything. Like when I watch it now as a dad, that's what I think about. I mean, that is so, I hadn't even thought about it like that. Can you imagine how your dad felt? Even if you'd, you know, we feel that way too when they strike out, but it's just like that feeling, I mean, that makes everything worthwhile. So I can't imagine. uh, Correct. And and like you said, it doesn't have to be sports. My, my, at the time he was in kindergarten, he was taking piano lessons and they weren't having, they had the talent show at school and he, we signed him up. He probably didn't know any better. You know, at that age, they're almost like, they don't know to be nervous. Right. He got up in front of the whole school and played a little Harry Potter intro on the piano. And I was like getting choked up in the audience. I was right. Like, it's just right. Yeah. What an incredible. Be, right. Any little moment like that. It's just, it's, it's special. Right. 
All right, before we wrap up here, tell us a little bit about you're in the children's book business of all the different things you do. You wrote a book. Can you tell us uh, how you got into that and, and what you're doing now? Sure. Thanks for asking. Um, when my son was born and then later my daughter, I, I basically was overcome with emotion. I had no intention of ever being an author. Um, and I had to get, you know, I had to try to find words that match the feelings in my heart. And I basically wrote a book. It became known as Made for Me. That's the one that became an international bestseller, translated to, you know, four or five different languages, sells a couple hundred copies a day, like way beyond anything I would have ever imagined. Um, you dream of having a bestseller. The book was not written for any financial purposes. Um, it was written literally from the heart and to share, you know, my feelings. And also because originally, you know, when my wife and I would read to our kids every night, you see all these books about loving moms, but you never really see the loving dad that has all this emotion, the same emotions that we see moms get, dads get too. And so that book was, was born. And based on the success of that book, I've kind of kept writing. Uh, Quarantine and COVID has, get, you know, gave me an opportunity to catch up on a lot of works that were in, in happening, but might not have, you know, been brought to fruition, you know, had my restaurants and bars been open, have an incredible, uh, was originally my mentor, then became a dear friend. Now my writing partner, Lori Friedman, who herself has published over 60 something books traditionally published. Her and I kind of joined forces. We have two series of books. One is the Little Book of series, where basically takes things like the Little Book of Kindness, the Little Book of Friendship, we even did the little book of camping. Um, we have the little book of patience coming out. And the one that literally just went live yesterday is the little book of presidential elections. And it basically takes these bigger ideas mostly and breaks it down and makes in, in children's picture book form and um, makes it easy to, to get the children and their parents to relate and open some discussions. And they're really great books. We're very, very proud of them. Um, so if, 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 if you agree with me that it's never too young to teach your little one of what democracy is, the right to vote, that the presidential elections one was a little bit tricky because we didn't want to get into like political parties and stuff like that. We just wanted to explain the process, democracy, how important it is to vote and what the president of the United States does. And then our other series is the little superhero series, which is very near and dear to me because it's, it's, it's modeled after my own kids. The two main characters are Ace and Ava, a brother and sister. And I don't know about anyone else's kids, but my kids are obsessed with superheroes. They want to be superheroes. They want to do superheroes. They want to battle. They want to save cities, battle bad guys, save the planet. So these are a series of, of books where the first one is called Superheroes Don't Clean Their Rooms or Do They? And the subtitle is, you know, The Power of Organization. Second one is Superheroes Don't Have Bedtimes or Do They? The Power of a Good Night's Sleep. And they're just basically fun ways to teach kids through superhero, you know, want to be superhero, little superheroes, these um, important lessons in, in life. I can get behind any book that encourages bedtime and yeah. cleaning your room. So that's good. On the election one, we have that on order. I'm excited to get it because it is, it's hard to talk about these things with your kids. You want them to learn and you can give them that little intro before bed. That's a great step. Well, and one of the things is, is that look, like it tells the process and then the parents can, you know, I do it with my kids all the time, not just with our books, but with other books, you know, there's certain things that hit with the kid that they want to discuss. And so you can either discuss it, you can table it for another night, which, you know, we've been done, we've been known to do too. Um, or you get into discussing these ideas, whether it's friendship, kindness, what does it mean to, you know, you know, and they all try to like teach a lesson where like, you know, uh, the kindness one, you know, it's never okay to make fun of someone, you know, it's important to include people. Um, so they're all very lessons and, and the inspiration comes from our real lives as, as parents. So I think that's what makes it so relatable and meaningful. Amazing. You are, Zach, you said it before, you are my uh, Miami Jesse. It's, uh, I don't know where yeah. you get the time. I don't know where you get the energy, but it's, uh, it's motivating to, you know, other dads like me to put yourself out there and, and, and to model that stuff for your kids. So I appreciate yeah. you being on the dad the best I can podcast. Zach. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me and I'll leave you with some of the words that that what some of the most important words that my dad has said to me. He says, uh, uh, you'll sleep when you're dead. Sleep when you're dead. That'll be the name of my my autobiography before I'm done. That is a good one. I almost forgot to show you. This is another story for another time. But can you see the mug I'm holding up here? Oh, I see it. I see it. Another, and if, you're, uh, if your listeners want to catch up with me, I'd love to hear from them. They can find me on the gram, Instagram at Zach, Z-A-C-K, Bush, B-U-S-H, and the number one at Zach Bush one. 
drop me a line. I'll reply. Give me a follow. I'll follow you back. And it was awesome to be here. And I thank you so much for having me. And I know I've turned, since you've been on the BYLR, I've, I've been turned on to some new podcasts. Um, so it's, it's been awesome. But, but, none is, but, but none are my favorite like Dad the Best I Can. They're all great, though. No, thank you. Thank you. I'll take the shameless plug, Zach. Thank you for being on. And I'm excited uh, to get the book in the mail and talk soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. See you, buddy.